exciting time in science as scientists worldwide fight climate change, break the genetic code, and more. But even with all this progress in research and understanding, there seems to be a remaining gender disparity in the science world. Well, Western Kentucky University's chemistry department is challenging the tide as one of its own is serving as the principal investigator on a collaborative project with NASA EPSCORP involving the International Space Station. And it could, in layman's terms, change the way we look at energy. Stay tuned. Outlook is next. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us at the round table. You know, if you were to visit the campus of Western Kentucky University and head to Snell Hall, go to the fourth floor on the campus here, you would find an impressive laboratory complete with state-of-the-art equipment, but more importantly, you'd find a group of motivated researchers determined to make a difference. WKU researchers are conducting experiments in connection with the International Space Station and NASA, which may ultimately affect every single one of us in the Consumer Energy Department. We're going to find out more about that exciting research as we welcome to the program three individuals in the trenches, part of that research group. Welcome with me, if you will, and I'm going to say your name correctly, Dr. Hamali Rothnyaki. Thank you so much for being here. It is my pleasure to be here. And you are the principal investigator on this project, which we will talk more yes, about. Yes, I am. In, with WKU's chemistry department. In addition, we are joined by Niherika Nirudu, who is a graduate student uh, as part of the research team, and Aubrey Penn, who's with something called the JUMP program. We're going to talk more about that. But uh, before we get started, you know, we talk a lot about science being it's difficult to approach science if you are not a scientist, that a lot of people are afraid of science. In your experience, do you find that to be true? It is actually true. So it's a, it's, it's a difficult, it's a challenging when we come to uh, putting our theory to practical aspect. Theory to practice is difficult. It's indeed. difficult. So, and especially, and we'll talk a little bit later in the program about the opportunities that, that these kinds of research projects present for students and of course for the university. But let's talk about your research, okay? So you're working with NASA, EBSCOR, and help us understand what EBSCOR stands for. It's an experimental program to stimulate competitive research. Competitive research. So uh, this, this group that's doing the funding wants competition, wants scientists mm -hmm. out there working toward that. Yeah, so the, it's a, they are a recognized EBSCO state. So Kentucky happened to be EBSCO state. And so every year, so we do have uh, one call for proposal submission through NASA for EBSCO grant. This is called EBSCO Research Area Grant. So that's, you select one competitive proposal going out from EBSCO State. So it's 2014 that uh, myself and the two research collaborators in University of Louisville, as Stuart Williams, as mechanical engineer, and Gerard Welling in the chemical engineering, and with University of Kentucky, that's Susanne Smith. So she's the director of the NASA EBSCO program. So Stuart William was the principal investigator of the whole research proposal, but we submit our proposal and then it got selected to move forward from whole Kentucky. And so finally it got funded from NASA as a EBSCO RA research grant. EBSCOR Area Research Grant. You'll be tested on that later. No, you won't. But, it's, but it is exciting in the fact that not only because of this funding through NASA, you have access to NASA, which means that, and I understand you have a, a, a lead-in to the International Space Station that you can actually connect with them. You personally, Dr. Hamali, as part of your research. That's exciting. <laughs> yes, it is. It's it is exciting. very exciting. So let's talk about what you're researching, okay? Because we talked about uh, practical applications for consumers when it comes to the area of energy. We are all, I would like to think, 
trying to be a little bit more energy efficient in, in the current state of things. So what is it that you're, you know, if you met me on an elevator and you wanted to tell me about your research, how would you pare that down and, and chime in here as, as research assistants? So what we're trying to do is that trying to capture that uh, solar energy. So it's as a main energy resource and capture into this small part of this very small flexible this solar panels we call and then produce electricity and that uh, take that to the consumer for uh, demand in the energy in the electricity. So basically that's, uh, the, this technology we can apply into different areas and appliances and it's small devices. Appliances, small devices that we won't have to rely on those batteries we can use solar energy. We know, Aubrey, of course, and uh, the fact that solar energy, is, it's out there, right? So you <laughs> are a student at Western Kentucky University studying chemistry. Mm -hmm. You're a graduate student who came here to be a part of this research team. Talk about, the, there's something called colloids. Am I saying it correctly? The colloids? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what, what, how does that fit into this research? Well, colloids, <laughs> uh, colloids are like uh, particles, molecules in a solution, dispersed in a solution. So now these collides have been like self-assembled, which means that automatically they self-assemble by themselves in a particular solution. So now when these collides are on the solar panel, so now the electricity, the electrons moving in those particular collides will generate electricity. That's what would say that. That's exciting. So they would create electricity mm -hmm. so we wouldn't be so reliant on other forms of energy. And did you want to add something to that? Um, uh, well, there's the, um, like the colloids, because the reason they're at the International Space Station is the microgravity. Here, we're under the force of gravity all the time, and that can affect how those particles form together into small conglomerates of particles. That, uh, the, the gravity affects that. So take them up in the International Space Station, they're not under that gravity, and we can see if they can form more efficiently or form better shapes, mm -hmm. I guess. It's, it's basically that when we uh, take this, these are uh, carbon plastic. Carbon or plastic? Plastic okay. materials. So, and because of the gravity, they easily can settle down. Like you dissolve your sand in the water and then they settle down drastically that you cannot put them into a nice surface to make these solar panels. But that's utilizing this um, microgravity environment that you can arrange these particles into different pattern the way that we can enhance the efficiency that absorb in the solar energy. So that's where the International Space Station does play in the role in this project that we send these particles and then they look at under microgravity can we assemble. It's Basically, so assemble means you organize, organize into a nice pattern that you can utilize whole solar energy ray into the, the surface. That's, that's exciting. Plastic <laughs> solar cells is kind of how we would wrap up this research. We're going to talk more about this exciting research from Western Kentucky University involving NASA and EBSCOR, the University of Louisville, and what it means for students and the university, but more importantly, what it means for you. Stay with us. Outlook continues. Welcome back to Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb, your host, and we are Talking Heads on a Mission. Our mission today is to inform you about exciting research being done at Western Kentucky University. In particular, we have representatives from the chemistry department who are working under a grant funded through NASA EPSCOR, working in conjunction with the University of Louisville, and they're doing exciting research on plastic solar cells. And what that means is practical applications for you and me. How nice would it be when your cell phone runs out that you don't need to plug it in and have a battery, you just would have this solar cell that would provide the necessary energy. So we're going to find out more about that as we welcome back to the program Dr. Hamali Rathnyaki, who is the principal investigator on this grant project, Niharika Nirudu and Aubrey Penn also working on the project. So before we get started, just for our audience who might be joining us, in, in just a few sentences, recap <coughs> what it is your research is about. It's research is about um, energy and can we capture that waste energy, solar energy, into electricity and then meeting the consumer demand in energy. So it's all about our research is uh, energy efficient that's making new material that can capture 
solar energy and the waste heat energy. And yeah, that way, the solar energy, and by the virtue of the fact that this grant that they're working under is funded through NASA, you have access to the International Space Station, where, now you said it's not called zero gravity. Microgravity. Micro Micro <coughs> There's a difference. We won't go into all of that, but <laughs> it's important to the research. Yes. Yes. It is. Now, you're up in Snell Hall on Western Kentucky University's campus where you do this research. You have, through this grant, been able to uh, accumulate some very nice equipment to help you do this research? Um, it's uh, particularly this uh, EBSCO grant that it's, uh, it's a funded uh, support graduate students and undergraduate students as material cost. But so different other sources, other external funding, we were able to uh, acquire that high-tech transformation electron microscope. High-tech transformation <laughs> electronic <laughs> microscope. It's a transmission uh, electron trans microscope. Okay. That's where we imagine these particles because these particles are, they are millionth of millimeter small. A millionth of a millimeter? Millimeter is small. And they range Put that in perspective <laughs> for me. Now I'm thinking of a pin dot or the end mm -hmm. of a pen. Are we still smaller? It's yes. smaller, smaller than that. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. So if you go to millimeter scale, it's a millionth of millimeter scale. So you really need this equipment mm -hmm. to be able to see these Image yes. these particles. So, yes. And so that's... Uh, we can take a look at these particles after we make and then using this transmission electron microscope. We acquired that through the National Science Foundation uh, external funding grant that uh, it was half a million and but actually we have been using this equipment not only for the research, it's also we using that for educational development education, and yeah. also for the course curriculum. And and other benefit is, I think, as in undergraduate aspect, that uh, Obi can explain that how this integrated into undergraduate education. Yes, the experience. integration. Yes, that's so. Basically, what you're saying is you were able through a National Science Foundation grant uh, able to acquire this amazing equipment that now lives at Western Kentucky mm -hmm. University, but it's not limited to the chemistry department nor to this research grant. It's cross crossing it's many different areas, and Aubrey. there's an entire class just to teach the TEM, the transmission, and the SEM, the scanning emission uh, electron microscope. Um, and and I mean, I go to conferences and we show our data and everything. And and one really exciting thing is I'll say something like, "I took these pictures," or and there are students that are surprised that I'm the one that was using the machine, and that's something that's special about having the machine that we can use. Hands on. Hands, Hands on, on, absolutely. Now, we mentioned, Niharika, that you uh, did your undergraduate work in India, but then came here as a graduate student. Yes. You are an undergraduate, but you're in something called the JUMP Start program. So help us understand yes. what that JUMP means. Yes, JUMP is Joint Undergraduate Master's Program. Um, it's just an accelerated program for me to get both my bachelor's and my master's degree in five years, rather than six normally. Okay. And you came here specifically to continue in, in this vein and to work with Dr. Hamali? To do my master's program in chemistry. And, and as you learn about this research, is this something you had studied as an undergraduate? Oh, well, I, was, I had my bachelor's in pharmacy, so I was more into chemistry, like what is the main reaction behind how these uh, drugs work. So I was more into chemistry, so that's why I've joined Dr. Hamali as she's, <laughs> like, she's a pro in organic chemistry. So I've joined her for that. You know, you brought up the word organic, and before we got started with the show, we wanted to make this, this is exciting stuff, but sometimes science can be mm -hmm. uh, unapproachable because it's, it's out there. And especially if you started using the lingo that you normally probably share between the three of you, we would all be lost. But, you know, we were talking about plastic solar cells. Originally, we were going to say organic solar cells, but we think there's a misunderstanding about what the term organic means. Among, oh, sorry. <laughs> Among the general community, thinking organic, you think about your food or, or your, your meat, your vegetables that you buy at the store being chemical free, being organic. Well, for us, organic is nothing all like chemicals. that. It, it's all chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> but all, all it means is that it's carbon-based materials, okay. which is most of everything. We are carbon-based materials. It's, it's yeah. easily recyclable. Easily recyclable. recyclable. Okay. It's not heavy metal. It's not metal. It's just carbon-based plastic. and recyclable. 
So okay. that's the other that's the advantage of these uh, solar panels. They are recyclable. After you use, you can throw it to trash. These solar panels that you hope uh, one day, and we're going to talk more about that in the, the next segment, but let's talk more about the involvement of students in research in general. At the head of the program, we talked about, you know, there's a real push internationally to get more women into the field of science. I have three women here. It just happened that way. We didn't plan it that way. You all happen to be working on this research mm -hmm. project. You know, you have your own experiences and your own stories of how you came to science, but why do you think so many women uh, turn away from science? Away from science because they don't understand maybe, or maybe there are no opportunities given for women. That's very true. The yeah. opportunities are maybe not necessarily always there for them. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. In the meantime, it's being in academic as a woman, it's, it's challenging. And so it's, uh, in my experience, as a women faculty member, it's, uh, it's not easy that uh, dealing with, you know, you have family life and you have academic life. And being in the active researcher in this academic field with your family, it's very challengeable for women because they have a family to take care. Mm -hmm. So you have to all the time struggle. So when you face to those struggling points that women tend to know, I really stay home rather than being academic. So I, gotcha. I think that's where that uh, really why women is pushing back being in the academic or the STEM field, science field, because they have opportunity, but they cannot grab the opportunity that they do have more um, kind of it's more related to, they, they, they always, they think, I need to have a family. I need to take care of my kids. And I think that's- It's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. So we should add to your resume juggler, because it's always <laughs> mm -hmm. having to balance um, yeah. you know, family life and the life of a researcher or an academician is, yes. You mentioned the STEM fields, science, technology, education, engineering and, and math. math, engineering and math, which we are trying to push more, more <coughs> female students uh, specifically toward that field. Your research at Western Kentucky University on the plastic solar panels not only includes undergraduates, graduates, but you're also using some students from the Gatton Academy at Western Kentucky University. Yes, I am. So I have been having Gatton Academy students total mo more than like 20, 25 20 students 25. last six years. And so we usually have three to four students every semester, Gatton Academy students. Actually, so we had the very good Gatton Academy students. They are very driven. They are very enthusiastic. And so they listen very well. Because so they're really high like that. age-wise, so. they are in, in high school, mm -hmm. but you know, intellectually, they are uh, out there very high mm -hmm. intellect. When I joined students. the group, I had two of our Gatton students at the time training me on doing things. I was a junior in college and having a senior in high school. And being a graduate, <laughs> I have been trained by a Gatton mm -hmm. student. That's beautiful. But what an, a wonderful opportunity for them mm -hmm. to get their hands on this kind of research at such an early age. Now, we're going to take a short break on Outlook, but we're going to uh, continue to wrap things up to let you know. Okay, so we do this research here at Western Kentucky University through this NASA EPSCoR grant on plastic solar cells. And and you know, what next? So let's say things go the way they are planned to go. Who holds the patent and, and how do we apply this to the corporate world, to the commercial world? We're going to talk about that more when Outlook continues right here on WKU-PBS. Won't you please stay with us? Thanks. Outlook continues. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're here to wrap things up now as we are talking about exciting research going on at Western Kentucky University specifically. I mean, there's a lot going on, but today at the table, we're talking about something going on in the chemistry department as we learn more about this grant with NASA, where there is access to the International Space Station, and it could have ramifications for you and I as we go forward because it's going to mean a more efficient solar energy source available to us. Dr. Hamali Rothniaki joins us, Niharika Nirudu and Aubrey Penn who are working on this project. And so once again, let's recap. We, we are looking at what you're studying in on the campus of Western Kentucky University could ultimately have applications for the consumer market. Yes, it could. In addition, it could have applications for NASA. We could have solar powered satellites Yes, that is true. So we can we can use this uh, technology that we're developing, and eventually, that uh, you can apply in the space shuttles. Space and, shuttles, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. 
to power up the satellites and the shuttles and all the ex space exploration of research and the scientific uh, findings that we can use as an energy source to power up all the equipment in space. Now, we talked about the connection of the International Space Station and um, know this lady because she has access. So because your research is actually there now as we speak on the International Space Station where they are doing... Yes, so the, the, let me clarify that the one of the part of this research program is this colloidal cell assembly. Co so colloidal cell colloidal assembly. Cell assembly. Okay. That's where the NASA current experiments going on in the International Space Station. So we make our particles at Western Kentucky University and then University of Louisville and University of Kentucky and especially Stuart Williams in mechanical engineering. He's the principal investigator of that part of the project. He's and at University of Louisville. Louisville University uh -huh. of Louisville. So we take these particles, we already send them to International Space Station. Now they study in that how these particles are arranging under microgravity conditions. Microgravity conditions. So how is, this is exciting to <coughs> me as a, as a novice, as, as outside, but for you who has made this your life's work, how exciting is it for you to go to the Glenn, the NASA, it's the Glenn Space Station or the area in Cleveland, Ohio? It, it is very exciting. And when I hear very first time asking to be a part of this project, I was like, this is so cool. And we never thought that our particles will end up in International Space Station. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in NASA Glenn Center and we're looking at this live images we coming from International Space Station of our particles. That was very exciting. So it's, yes, it is. Live images happening mm -hmm. right there on the International Space Station. There are your particles. Now, before the break, we were talking about this is exciting research. And, and I think you mentioned the fact that, you know, reality versus um, theory and theory versus reality and what, you know, it should work. But that's why we have research, to make sure right. that it does work. If but we it, knew what we were doing, we wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't be doing it. So, you know, there's a point at which this grant's going to run out, and you're going to say, well, was it successful? How does that work? You know, at what point do you say, we're done, it worked, or it didn't? It's, it, this, is, this is not like you can see the product or the success in within three years. So this is the long term we have to research on this. So this grant is only just supporting for three years to just to look at these particles or the colloidal, how they assemble under microgravity. Then after that, so we need to continue that supporting through other external funding and to get these particles into other applications. It's not only specifically solar cells. We can, there are majority feel that we can use these colloidal crystals into different applications. Colloidal crystals, you'll hear more about that. So this is ongoing. So if we were dreaming in a perfect <coughs> world when all your hard work and all this research would be applicable to, to someone watching this, you anticipate it would be 25 years down the road? If you want to see that the space solar cell develop. Space solar cells, mm -hmm. okay. It's kind of the solar panel that with this technology, we're looking at down the road about 15 to 20 yes. years down the road. 15 to 20. And then we talked before the break about when you do these kinds of research and say you're successful and you get a patent and or you apply it to some kind of consumer way, who then owns these rights or these patents? How does that work? And I suspect it's different with <laughs> each. It is, it yeah. is. And since that anything that we develop in at WKU, that intellectual property is uh, belongs to Western Kentucky University, and but you have rights to the founder, and that's mean if I introduce the technology, technology, I will be the founder of the technology. Are you saying founder? You're the founder of the technology? Founder of the technology. Yeah. Okay. And but it uh, belongs to specifically to Western Kentucky University. There's a percentage they are going that 
sixty percent to Western Kentucky University and forty percent to the that's who is the who introduced the technology. I see. So that's it goes to principal investigator. So you know, as we talk about this exciting research and we have three women who work in the science field, is this something as a young girl, think about when you were young girls, did you say, one day I'm gonna do something <laughs> great in the science field or one day did you even think that you would work in the science field? I never thought that I would be here <laughs> one day, definitely not. Like so like I'm grateful to Dr. Hemali for being like, I knew nothing when I, when I came here. Like I didn't know anything about chemistry, so like, because of her, I'm here. Because you studied pharmacy, you said, mm -hmm. back but in. But we had in pharmacy, like we had chemistry in pharmacy too, but we were more focused on pharmaceutical drugs than chemistry. And yes. we're lucky that we live in a time where little girls can <laughs> look up and say, I want to be a scientist when I grow up, you know, not just a mom or, or a hairdresser or something, all respect. Oh, but, but moms <laughs> and hairdressers. Moms and hairdressers <laughs> are too. extremely... Uh, necessary. <laughs> but as a young but girl, did you, did you want to be a scientist? Absolutely not. No. I am right here right now because of a fantastic lineup of teachers and professors who cared and worked hard for me, including Dr. Himali. And, and I had one specific teacher in high school that he saw more in me than I ever saw in myself, really, and, and I had so many classes with him. But, but teachers, I don't think realize sometimes the impact they have and, and they're really all so to true. thank for me being here right now. A little girl who can do science <laughs> and you as well growing up in Sri Lanka. Uh, yes it is and when I grow up and I, I I think when I was in the fifth grade, I really wants to be that I had the dream that I want to come to USA. Mm -hmm. So that was that that dream grow up since I was fifth grade. So my mom and my dad, my dad is a school teacher. I so when I did my you know, high school, I said, I want to go to USA, do PhD. Then he looked at me, is it possible? So that's where I start my journey. And I and think it's a perfect opportunity to end the program with that by saying, Anything's possible. Thanks so much for sharing your stories, for sharing your information. We're going to put up a website where you can go and take a look at what these three women are working on here at Western Kentucky University, plastic solar cells. That's going to wrap it up for this week's edition of Outlook. I'm Barbara Deeb. We're glad you joined us. Thanks. <laughs>